In this video, we will be looking at topic four of GCSE chemistry, and that is chemical changes. Here are some of the subtopics we'll be looking at throughout this video. And as always, these pages will be available to buy on my Etsy in the description. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoy. First of all, we have the pH scale. The pH of a substance is measured using universal indicator or a pH probe and meter. The universal indicator will turn one of the colours on the scale below, as you can see in the middle of the screen, and a pH meter will return a number from 0 to 14. Anything on the red hand side or left of the number 7, the neutral colour, is an acid, and anything between 8 and 14 is classed as an alkali. Examples of different acids include battery acid, lemon juice and acid rain, and examples of alkalis include bleach, soap powder and washing up liquid. I would definitely recommend remembering at least three examples of each of those, and if you do think of any others, please let me know down below. And the only real example of a neutral substance is pure water, that's all you really need to remember. Next we have acids and bases. An acid is simply, as we said before, a solution with a pH 7 or lower. But the new fact about acids that is really important is acids form H plus ions in water. So they dissolve and form H plus ions. Bases are any substance that will form a salt when reacted with an acid. It's a very common mistake that people think that an alkali and a base is exactly the same thing. As we can see on the second bullet point, an alkali is a form of a base with pH more than 7. Alkalis, instead of H plus ions like acids, they form OH minus ions in water. It is also important that you are aware what causes a strong or weak acid or alkali. As you can see written down below, a strong acid or alkali ionizes completely in water, and this means it releases lots of those H plus for an acid or OH minus for an alkali ions. There are quite a few reactions that are important to remember that you could be asked to kind of fill in the blanks or that kind of thing within your exam. So up the top, I've put the two that are the most different. So water plus a metal makes metal hydroxide and hydrogen. And if you think about it, water is just two hydrogens and an oxygen. So if you take metal and react it with those two things, metal hydroxide is just going to be the metal plus an oxygen and a hydrogen, which leaves you with a hydrogen. So if you understand a bit about the atomic like makeup behind water or these compounds, it can make these reactions a lot easier to remember. The other one on the right hand side is an acid and a metal make salt and hydrogen. And it's a very similar thing. So an acid could be an example such as nitric acid and iron. So the salt comes from the iron and the nitric acid forming iron nitrate. And acids have hydrogen in it, as we found before, when it's dissolved in water. So that is why the extra hydrogen is on the end there. The other four reactions you have to remember are forms of neutralization reactions. Neutralization reactions are simply when you have an acid, so a low pH, reacting with a high pH, like an alkali or a base, and they kind of neutralize each other. So the four we have is acid plus base makes a salt and water. Acid plus metal oxide makes salt and water. Acid plus metal hydroxide makes salt and water. And then acid plus metal carbonate makes salt, water and carbon dioxide. So again, a lot of those are fairly similar. Very important to remember that metal oxide, metal hydroxide and metal carbonates are all bases, which is why they are classed as neutralization reactions. And something key to remember at the bottom about different acids and what salts they create. So sulfuric acid creates sulfates, nitric acid creates nitrates, and hydrochloric acid creates chlorides. So as I said before, if you had something like aluminium reacting with sulfuric acid, it would create aluminium sulfate. Or if you had copper reacting with hydrochloric acid, that would create copper chloride. So it's just simply the metal and the salt. Next we have the reactivity series. Now this is something I believe you are given in the exams. However, I would also recommend remembering a good chunk of it. So you can see a lot of the top elements on this list are group one elements and they are typically known as being very reactive. 
And as you go down the list, you get some more copper, silver and gold. They're like the transition metals in the middle of the periodic table. So sometimes it is a bit of common sense and you can kind of remember which ones are going to be higher than others when it comes to those exam questions. But effectively, the reactivity series lists in order how reactive different metals are in comparison to each other. The reactivity is determined by how easily they lose electrons. So again, potassium, sodium, lithium, all in group one, they will lose that one electron very easily. Carbon and hydrogen, you'll notice are on the list and they're in red. Now they are not metals, obviously, they're non-metals. The reason they're included is because it gives us an idea of if we have to extract that metal from its natural form, so from like an ore, for example, then if it's more reactive than carbon, there's certain methods we can use to extract it. And if it's less reactive than carbon, there's other methods. And the same kind of thing happens with hydrogen. Next, we have redox reactions. This is just a reaction where electrons are transferred. Now, there are two more keywords we're going to learn about in this page, and that is oxidation and reduction. Reduction and oxidation is where the name redox gets its name from, because reduction and oxidation makes redox if you shorten it. And something very important to remember is oxidation is loss and reduction is gained. And that is remembered with the mnemonic oil rig. What that actually means, what it's losing and gaining is just the electrons. So as you can see in the little purple box, a loss of electrons is called oxidation and a gain of electrons is reduction. Again, could just simply be a definition that you need to understand and be able to recite. An example of what I've got here is a type of redox reaction called a displacement reaction. And this works hand in hand with the reactivity series. So Fe, iron, plus CuSO4, so that is copper sulfate, reacts to make iron sulfate, FeSO4, and Cu. Now, all you can see here is the iron is more reactive than the copper. So basically what happens is the iron displaces the copper and binds with the sulfate. Finally, we have electrolysis. Effectively, all that happens is you've got your purple liquid in this case, which is called an electrolyte. And that is usually a compound of metal and a non-metal. So in this case, I've got aluminium and bromine. You've got a DC, so a direct current power supply at the top. And that is supplying electrons to both of the electrodes. So the positive and negative, the anode and the cathode that are dipped into the electrolyte. Now, all this does is when the metal and the non-metal ions are in that electrolyte, the positive metal ions are attracted towards the cathode because they are positively charged. And the negatively charged non-metal ions are attracted to the anode, the positive electrode. At each of the cathode and the anode, the electrons are either stripped from the ion or electrons are given to the ion to neutralise them both. And then once this happens, the metal ions will sink and form a molten metal layer at the bottom and the non-metals float up to the surface, often as a gas, and escape through that way. And this is just explained in a more concise summary at the bottom of the page. That sums up the end of topic four, chemical changes. And the next topic we're going to be looking at is energy changes. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this helped. And please like and subscribe if you found this useful.